This is Holes to Heavens, a show dedicated to cosmos, to mythos, and to psyche. If you like what you're about to listen to, please consider leaving some stars or a review, or you can always share it with a friend. Welcome back to the podcast. This one's being recorded January 25th, 2021, and it's with John Martineau. If you're not familiar with John, he wrote an amazing little book of coincidences in the solar system and also started a book series called The Wooden Books, which is just one of the best. Exploring esoterica, folklore, fringe sciences, it's one of my favorite things. And there's a compilation, a couple of them, that you might be familiar with too, called Quadrivium and Trivium as well. These are beautiful and deeply informative books. And so this contribution to the world that John has done is just incredible. So check it all out. And in this show, we talk about a few coincidences. Why are the sun and the moon the same size in the sky? The Venus Pentagram, which we've talked a lot about on this show. Ice Halos, which we have not talked about on this show. And many other little coincidences as well. So I think you can enjoy this one. I'm still in Madeira. Stuck here, I suppose. And I'm not complaining. Our second flight back to the UK has been cancelled. And so we're here probably until March maybe longer, COVID willing, we shall see. But yeah, great view out the window as I record this. Sun is setting and the music in the background is by Sarah Palu, P-A-L-U, Sarah Palu. Some beautiful tunes, check her out, support the music. And the Dreaming with the Moon class went quite well yesterday, which I kind of treated as the prelude. The Constellating Psyche, this big program that is officially going to begin next month. And if you want to be a part of it, there's no registration. You just become a patron of my work at the $10 level. Or you don't even need to do that. You can just purchase the class as they come each month. And Patreon way, definitely the better route because you get half off by doing that. And you also support the podcast and get to be a part of the parlors get access to the patron only shows so you can go to patreon.com slash adam summer if you want to be a part of constellating psyche or just to support the podcast and if that doesn't interest you but you do want to share some love for the podcast in my writing you can just go on your podcast app leave some stars and a review take a screenshot of it send it to me And I'll link you to the Dreaming with the Moon class if you'd like, or the Complete Crypto class, or really any class that is on my website, just for leaving some stars in a review on your podcast app. So just take a screenshot and send it to me. This podcast is also brought to you by Solar Fire. If you want to get some of the best astrology program in the world, in your life, just go to alabe.com, use promo code SOMA, and you will get 15% off of Solar Fire. So, without saying anything else, this is John Martineau and I just the other day talking about coincidence and how they show up in our neck of the universe. Enjoy, and I will see you on the other side of it. John, welcome to the podcast. Hi, Hi Adam. It's really nice to be with you today. Yeah. Yeah. I've been a fan of your work for quite some time. In fact, one of the first things that happened to me when I visited London for the first time was I went to the astrology shop and I saw a carousel of the wooden books. And I was like, oh, these are interesting. Like every topic pretty much of these little things are interesting to me. And then that night I went out to dinner with Adam, who you know, and he gave me his version of one and I didn't even know he had one. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so, that's kind of my intro to you, John. 
Well, that's great. Um, yeah, they're, they've been a, a source of great joy to, to me, actually, the Wooden Book series. They, um, they just continue to stretch me and intrigue me and, uh, and educate me. I love working with, with all our authors and, um, we're not even, I, I keep on thinking we must, must be nearly there. Uh, we must have done a book on everything that, uh, interests me. Uh, but I think at the moment we've got about 50 in the pipeline, 50 new ones coming up, including two more with Adam Tetlow. Um, one's, uh, nearly complete. I think those are the two I'm working on at the moment. One on something called the, with him, called the the diagram we're calling it, which is an extraordinary piece of geometry that uh, unifies harmony and geometry. Something I was going to do my PhD in, interestingly, but they couldn't find anyone to supervise it. And I now realise if I had done my PhD, I would have missed this completely. And uh, five years later, Adam Tetlow would have come along and put egg all over my face. <laughs> so um, it's been great working with him on that. And then he's doing a second one on ancient metrology, and uh, which will be really interesting, which we've all got a, a keen interest in. And then we've got one's forthcoming as well on numbers, modern number theory, really. And another one on plot and plotting in, uh, in literary form. And a whole load more coming along too. Yeah. That's exciting. Now, I've noticed a gap, but maybe I haven't seen it, John, but mm -hmm. you don't have one on astrology, I don't think. We, we don't yet have one on astrology, no. Um, interestingly, I've just finished a book on divination with a lady called Jules Rocker, who's been brilliant to work with, and she's a very keen astrologer and was keen to do one on astro astrology, but um, I think there is a gap there. She's finally taught me around into the fact we need one, but I don't know if she really wants to do it or not. I think she'll do it if she has to. Why would you like to have a, have a go at it, Adam? <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about it afterwards. I think <laughs> right. I, I know people that would be a better fit. I could, mm -hmm. maybe, maybe we'll talk about it. We'll talk about mm -hmm. it. But uh, yeah, for everyone listening, if you're not familiar with what John and I are talking about, these wooden books, they're incredible. And I noticed as well, since I've been back in the US, they show up in bookstores. So they're all over the place. And yeah, amazing. Yeah. Yours, maybe that's like the entry point into just who you are and your work, because I've known about the little book of coincidence in the solar system for quite some time. And that's the one that you wrote in the wooden book series, right? That is correct. Um, yeah, I wrote that one. Um, I was a student at the Prince's School for Traditional Arts, as it's now named. I think they're renaming it again. Back then it was called the Visual Islamic and Traditional Arts Department of the Prince's School of Architecture. I was a student there under Keith Critchlow and um, I became very interested in this. Keith showed me these pictures, particularly of the Venus diagram, a book by Joachim Schultz, which I think is republished by Floris, but which used to be very hard to get hold of. And Keith showed me these uh, pictures of the way that the planets move around one another, geocentric plots that Schultz had done. He was the astronomer, I think, for the Steiner movement uh, with an observatory in Switzerland. And I was absolutely um, astonished by these. And I sat down and wrote some computer programs to uh, recreate them and also to just discover if there were any other geometrical or harmonic relationships between any of the planets. And I was encouraged by a man called Archie Roy, Professor Archie Roy, who was a professor of ast astronomy at Glasgow University. And I asked him if he'd seen any of these, these solutions and he hadn't. And they, that encouraged me on. I eventually, as my MA thesis, bound up all of my discoveries into a big book called The Book of Coincidence. And I sat on that for a few years and then um, discovered a few other things in passing and then simplified it all into the little book of coincidence and improved the diagrams quite a lot as well. And it is quite an interesting collection of, of uh, um, extraordinary coincidences in our, in our own solar system, sort of easy ways of drawing the, the orbits of the planets um, or, or, or understanding their, their harmonies. How would you define coincidence, John? It's a word that we use a lot, but the mm. depth of it is an extraordinary implication. How would you define it? Yes, it is a really, it is a very, very interesting thing. I'm just reading a book actually on um, synchronistic coincidences uh, by a Jungian therapist, which I'm enjoying a lot. It's my second time reading it. And he's very, he's very good on it as well. He basically says that a, a coincidence as, a, as opposed to just a random occurrence, 
we tend to use that word when when something has an additional level of meaning to it. So when there's a when there's a, a meaning in something, uh, we tend to use the word coincidence. I mean, obviously, if you think about the scientific project or science in general, scientists use coincidence all the time to to uh, to advance science because science is essentially the study of patterns in nature. So um, any 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 pattern that that a scientist observes, they it, it, you could say, well, it's a coincidence, but um, it's not really how we tend to use the word. We tend to use the word when something extraordinary happens, which we wouldn't expect to be there. Uh, a synchronicity that's uh, kind of going the extra mile, if you like. And and uh, this writer, I'd have to go and get the book. I can't remember his name. He's very good. Um, he um, also suggests that that it's has this extra level of meaning. Hmm. I heard a quote recently that I adore. Coincidences are God's way of staying anonymous. <laughs> yeah, I think that's um, that's a really good one, isn't it? Yeah. Um, they they are at the they're at the core of I would have thought uh, uh, to subjects like like uh, astrology as well because astrology must for it to work it must assume that there is a synchronistic engine really with the planets as uh, as the froth on the top that that we can examine to see what's going on under the surface. So, um, but that's a lovely quote. I mean, the classic example is the one of the sun and the moon appearing the same size. It's a really good one to to, to think about. Um, we've got these two big lights in the sky, one we see by day primarily and one we primarily see by night. And, and yet there they are, this exactly the same size at this particular epoch in human history. If we'd lived in the time of the dinosaurs, the, the moon was closer to the earth and about a third larger in the sky. But uh, here we are, an intelligent species, and ever throughout human history, we've had these two lights in the sky, exactly the same size in the sky, also with the ability for one to cover the other. And, uh, and we are, you know, we are symmetrical, left, right, symmetrical, and uh, divided into two sexes, men and women. And the whole thing, ha again, is imbued with meaning. So the, the, uh, the experience, if you start to think about it, of the sun and the moon and the perfect balance between them is, is, is very beautiful and very meaningful. If you allow it to take meaning for you, um, of course, uh, a lot of people will simply not allow it to take meaning for them and say, well, it's just a meaningless coincidence. One of them's uh, 400 times larger than the other and 400 times further away. So one's left with the, um, one's left with the option how to, how to interpret these things. But I think it's quite easy to see that something like that does have meaning. And I think there are other very clear examples in our solar system too of uh, coincidences, which, uh, which are very meaningful. Do we know when the proximity was perfect for this version of life to spring from, from our planet? Do we have an idea of that? Of the sun and the moon? Yeah. Um, I'm afraid I don't know. I, I think I did know at some point and I've forgotten, but um, <laughs> I, 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 cannot, I can't remember if it's, I think we're past the, the moment, but I'm not sure. And so what you were saying, because that's new to me, that mm -hmm. around 65 million years ago at the time of the dinosaurs, the moon was much closer. How much closer? Was uh, it? it was it was considerably closer. The moon, it, moon is moving away very, very slowly. And uh, it was a third larger in the sky, as far as I understand, in the time of the dinosaurs. And that would have created much more dynamic patterns within the earth right in the oceans and and all the tides wouldn't it between that's correct so the length length of time between the tides were on a different cycle um the the brightness at night would have been different uh, the high tides would have been greater um and they can see that in the in the fossil records and particularly the the coastal records hmm. You learn something old every day, John. I did not know this one. <laughs> yeah, it is interesting because, of course, if we were having this conversation back then, uh, we wouldn't be saying that there was a perfect coincidence between the, the sun and the moon. So uh, it is interesting that coincidence has, has occurred when there is a species uh, of sufficient intellectual capacity to, to, to sort of remark about it. Yeah, yeah. Now, something our mutual friend Adam talks about and mm -hmm. I really enjoy this is just around geometry and number and how if we could see into the mind of God, it would be number and geometry and, and music to an extent. It'd be the quadrivium, right? Mm -hmm. like that's what we would witness. And when you use such a simple example of the proportion or the size of sun and moon and how we see it, and you just sit with that for a moment, like, is it just a meaningless coincidence? And if it's not, 
then right. What does it mean? But for you, where does it take you? Like, is it proof of a divine mind? And I'm just curious of like how you articulate the wonder that these coincidences create in you. Mm. Well, it's the it's the subject of my forthcoming book. I've ah. used locked, lockdown to uh, to go back to this subject, not having written about it really since 2001 when I did the little book of coincidence. Um, I've really focused in on on three coincidences, which I think are there, there are a lot of coincidences that one could point to, um, but I focused in on three particular. I think it's easy to do three. It's a rhetorically sound approach as well. Um, so I've started with the sun and the moon, which I think is very meaningful. Um, the next one I've taken is uh, one that I, I, I was really studying in depth uh, back then as well, which is the Venus pentagram. Mm. And my understanding of the Venus cycle has really deepened, I think, since 2001. I've been thinking about it a lot. I give talks on it. Um, the um, there's an aspect of it as well, which took me a long time to understand. And that is really to do with the fiveness of it and where the five is coming from and how unusual the five would be. And I had to go right back to the harmonograph, which is uh, one of our early books in wooden books and is a series of pictures that um, are drawn by this Victorian machine called a harmonograph. And my grandfather wrote that book and I grew up with one of these machines uh, plotting swinging pendulums and drawing these but these pictures on pieces of paper and you you what to produce these pictures you're really playing around with with harmonies and plotting plotting pictures plotting relationships between different harmonies and to get a five on a piece of paper a five petal flower any five fold form in in a rotary form as a flower if you like you only need to have um a ratio that's that differs by five so the Venus, the Venus diagram, when we look at it, Venus going around the Earth, you can see there's this fivefold pattern, the Venus rose, which is incredibly beautiful. And it doesn't appear in any modern astronomy books to date that I've ever seen. It is the relationship between Earth and, and our closest neighbor. And you would have thought that that would warrant a plot in, a, in an ancient book. I've just tracked, a, I've just tracked down a, a plate of it from the 1820s, which I think is the earliest plot of it I've yet found. Um, and just managed to buy a copy of that. It, it is an extremely important diagram. So I really set to thinking about this fivefold form and wanting to understand why it was five. And over time, I began to realize that the harmonograph pictures are drawn as the difference between the ratio. So the I could draw that as, let's say, an eight to a three. So if the, if the ratio between Earth's and Venus's orbits was eight to three, I would also get a five-fold pattern. If they were nine to four, I would also get a five-fold pattern. If they were, and, and so on. If they were if they were 10 to five, I would get a five-fold pattern. Hmm. Um, but in fact, the, the ratios between the uh, Venus's orbit and Earth's orbit is eight to 13. So Venus goes around the sun 13 times for every eight times that Earth goes around the sun. And what's very interesting about the fact that this five is coming out of an eight and a 13, as opposed to anything else, is that you've got five, eight, 13. And I think this is one of the things that then for me becomes extra meaningful because that five could have appeared pretty much lots of different ways. We could be, it could have been derived lots of different ways, but it's being derived from two Fibonacci numbers and not just any two Fibonacci numbers. It's being derived from the two Fibonacci numbers which govern if you like, all life on earth, all plant life and humans, including our teeth are in. So we have five teeth in each quarter of our mouth as a child, they fall out and are replaced by eight teeth in each quarter of our mouth. So we have 13 teeth in each quarter of our mouths uh, over a lifetime, five, eight, 13. Uh, if you count the number of spirals on a pineapple or a, or, or a pine cone, or even that spiraling broccoli that you can buy, the Romanist bro broccoli, you can count the spirals on your plate at dinner time. you will get fives, eights, and 13s. You very rarely get 21s and 34s and the higher Fibonacci numbers in nature. You do occasionally, obviously, in, in sunflower heads and certain um, daisies and things. But really, most of the time, as you walk around, if you take a walk in the park or look around your garden, 
uh, you're surrounded by five eights and thirteens. And so I chose that as my second example that mm -hmm. our closest planet is doing five eight thirteen because it's extremely meaningful that it, it is and and extremely unexpected. You wouldn't expect to find a five eight thirteen in in our planet's relationship with its closest neighbor. And for my third example, I took a piece of research that I stumbled on about um, 10 years ago, which is to do with ice halos and um, an extraordinary coincidence between ice halos and planetary orbits. And um, ice halos are those, you, you occasionally see sun dogs, two little rainbows to the left and the right in the sun. Mm -hmm. uh, on, a, on a cold evening, you might see them, or even in the summer when there's ice in the upper atmosphere. And those two rainbows are little rainbow spots will appear at, they're called, it's called the 22 degree halo. They'll appear at about 22 and a half degrees, so slightly outside the halo, the, the spots, uh, 22 and a half degrees left and right of the sun. And I knew from the octagonal, my octagonal construction of Mercury's orbit, that Mercury lives at 22 and a half degrees each side of the sun. Became really interested in this thinking, well, this is really strange. Um, why have we got rainbows where where Mercury is? And, and then a few years later, uh, after stumbling on that, not really thinking very much about it, I just parked it. Um, but I was out on a, in a summer afternoon in my dad's swimming pool, uh, funnily enough, on a summer afternoon, and there was obviously some ice in the upper atmosphere. And there, lo and behold, I looked up, was this colossal um, structure called, called a, a, it's a full halo or uh, perhelia, um, which the Victorians called a glory. And it's two of these uh, double rainbows, two of these rainbows around the sun with a whole load of arcs and things, a little bit like a giant symbol for Mercury, if you like. But there, there are two of these uh, things. So I immediately went on online, tracked down a, a meteorologist and bought a couple of books on atmospheric halos and, and glories and discovered that there was a second uh, uh, rainbow that... Um, that appears at 26 degrees from the sun. And I thought, well, that's extremely strange because 26 degrees from the sun is where Venus lives. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of thought, well, what are the odds actually that the only two rainbows you ever see around the sun would exactly map onto the planetary orbits, the mean planetary orbits of the only two planets between us and the sun. So when you see one of these things at sunset, whenever you see them, you're actually looking at the orbits drawn for you uh, as rainbows, exactly mapped onto them. And I chose that as my third example. I have got loads of more of these. So I chose my third one because it seemed to sort of complete the set for me in that I couldn't think of any, th any better way of setting up a series of coincidences. If I was a creator and I wanted to set up something to make people leave some clues to make people scratch their heads and go, wow, I would probably leave a sun and moon the same size I would probably um, leave my closest planet doing the same squiggle as all of the uh, all the plants on Earth, and I'd probably leave a couple of rainbows mapping onto the <laughs> onto the two orbits. You couldn't improve on it. You couldn't either make it up either. If you made it up as a device in a science fiction book, no one would would believe it. So, so I chose those as my three examples as to what I think is going on. Um, I'm, um, I think I'm hedging my bets a little bit in the book, but I'm probably a Wheelerite, I think, um, in the end. I, I, think, um, I think it has something to do with us being here. So um, I, my, I think the book, I'm not, I'm not going to, I'm not in the book, I'm not going to go off into theological directions because it's scientific suicide. And um, I may do that in another book later, but for the time being, um, I want to, I really want to make the point that I think this has got something to do with us being here. And if that is true, um, and we're in a kind of wheel, wheeler, John Wheeler took over Einstein's chair at Princeton. And um, towards the end of his life, he, he came up with a theory to do with the optimization of the universe, which was a participatory approach saying that um, observers essentially are creating observers are creating the the effects that they're observing and so really as far at the moment I, I really just want to go as far as to say that I think it's got something to do with observers this is 
these are a series of coincidences that are there to be observed. They're there because we are here to observe them. And thereby, therefore, as a scientist, which I'm, I'm, on, I'm in personally in both camps, but, you know, if you stay in the scientific camp for a moment, um, as a scientist, I think we can make a prediction. And that prediction would be that if and when we discover intelligent life on other planets, we will also expect to find ridiculously unlikely and beautiful things going on around them. And maybe we could even use uh, the existence of ridiculously beautiful uh, things going around planets as, as a sign that maybe there's, uh, there's some intelligent life on that planet. So I'm really suggesting that, uh, that observers, if you like, warp, warp their local reality and they warp it towards symmetry and meaningful beauty. That is an answer right there, John. So let's start with your number three and work our way back to Venus, because that's a subject I can riff on pretty well with yeah. you. Great. And so ice halos, I think we all know what they are. I just want to clarify for anyone that's like, wait, like, what is it again? So it's the rainbows that you see around both the sun and the moon. I've heard them called moon dogs before, but it's uh, g- glories to the Victorians, you say? Like, yeah. The- Okay. I, okay. That's right. The, the lunar ones, I think we can just leave them to one side for a moment because lunar halos uh, can be of lots of different sizes. It's um, They don't tend to be within such a, a, a small range. So l- lunar halos, uh, you can get them quite close to the moon, a little bit further away and I've seen lunar halos of all sorts of different sizes. The the solar halos, do t- although they can move around as well, you do tend to really see them at the, uh, at, at the uh, 45 degrees and um, or sorry, 22 and a half degrees um, each side of the sun, and um, and and at 46 more more rarely. And so and clarity also, around, or oh, sorry, but clarity mm-hmm. around that when you're using the degrees, are you using that from the horizon or from the sun? Left left and right of the sun, and if you get to see the full circle, then yeah, that'll be a vertical vertical circle as well. So you're taking at one point of your comp- compass on the sun, or if you point one arm to the sun and one arm to the, to the rainbow, you'll be opening your, your, your hand, um, at, if you, if you, at to, to 22 and a half degrees for an ordinary sun dog or 46 degrees if you, if on the second one. So you, mm-hmm. again, you're pointing, you're pointing to the orbit of, of Mercury, mean orbit of Mercury or the mean orbit of Venus. Mm, that is incredible. It really, it really is incredible it, it, it's uh it shouldn't again it sort of shouldn't really be there um but it is it is in the observer element as well i mean who i mean if, if it wasn't us observing it i mean there's not any other life just because of how our eyes are designed as well that we can even pick up the colors of the rainbow and be able to see yeah. it in such a way and so there's just too many coincidences that line it, up there really are there's a fascinating um thing I stumbled on, which I think I am going to put in the new book, because you always have to be careful, I've discovered as a book editor, you have to be very careful of anything that an author has just discovered. It'll be the thing they, they're most excited about, and mm-hmm. um, they definitely have to get in. And uh, But the thing, I, the thing I just discovered the other day, which uh, really continues to intrigue me, is the fact that water, which of course is abundant in our universe, is essentially opaque to almost all uh, frequencies of uh, electromagnetic radiation except for visible light so um if you look at if you look at if you look at what water does it kind of it blocks everything it blocks everything you look at the graph it blocks all the infrared all the radio waves doesn't let anything through doesn't let anything through and then it's almost if you look at look at the absorption and and, uh, a diagram of it and then there's this sudden kind of it almost looks like someone's kind of carved out a little groove and then it so it lets through visible light and then it back up again and it blocks everything else on the other side of the spectrum. It's quite extraordinary that water should permit the passage of the narrow band of, of radiation. That is what the universe is bathed in essentially, which is the black, the peak of the black body radiation. And um, the universe is awash with visible light. That's why we see in that spectrum because that's what the universe is basically awash with. And, and water only lets that, that through. It's quite incredible. 
That's not going to make it into the new book, though. <laughs> Too new. I think it. Too. I think it will. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. I think um, categorize it under serendipity because I think serendipity <laughs> is a great word. Uh, if serendipity goes along with coincidence, but it's um, it's related to it, and I want to deal with deal with serendipity, uh, maybe even more than coincidence. Um, but um, it's it comes into the fine the fine tuning problem quite a lot because, of course within the fine tuning problem in modern cosmology we've got to this fact that the universe is or appears to be extremely finely tuned uh to optimize the existence of biological life like ourselves if we fiddle with the uh, the mass of the electron or the up quark or or anything uh things go wrong or the balance between the the two forces we live in an incredibly narrow range of of uh, permissible values for the fundamental parameters constants of our universe and um that's fine you know you can say that's fine that's the fine tuning problem of modern cosmology but it 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 gets even more interesting when you get into things that are serendipitous that kind of are just really really nice they don't have to be there it's not like the universe wouldn't work let's say if if um water didn't transmit visible light if that if that extraordinary ability of water just to let through only that those tiny bands of electromagnetic radiation was shifted like one percent to the left um it probably life would still <laughs> would still work but all the seas would be black um and water everywhere wouldn't be letting through the radiation that the universe is fundamentally bathed in so it would presumably be a bit harder so things like that i'm class categorizing as as serendipitous rather than um necessary and they are you know, they all make you think. The whole, the whole load of them really, really make you think. And, mm. uh, yes, really, really good fun. Thanks for adding that in there. I have a view of the ocean right out my window, <laughs> and <laughs> it's 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 nice to have that into the the contemplative pot. Yeah. Now let's go back to your number two, and. Mm-hmm. Whenever I think about the Venus cycle in the five, eight, and thirteens, and just how it appears everywhere, I this thought comes up often where I, I wish I could just travel into the mind of Robert Persig. Or have you ever read Zen of the in the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance? Have you read this oh, book? A, lo- a long time ago. I think I was a student, and I have a hazy memory of that particular <laughs> period of my life. But, um, but yeah, but it drives him insane. Well, the protagonist in the book the search Mm -hmm. for quality because it Mm -hmm. can't be defined with his, his logic, his rhetoric, his reason, his, his, whatever his approach is. It's a very heady book that I didn't fully understand, but he was going truly crazy because he couldn't solve the problem of what, where quality comes from in the universe. Mm -hmm. And when you look at the Venus cycle and already a lot that you've laid out, there is a lot of the evidence to chew on of what gives quality or aesthetic even to our experience of being human. What would you add to that? I, I would absolutely agree with you um, completely, Adam. Um, I think it's a fundamentally aesthetic problem. It's uh, the beauty of it. It's interesting that Venus kind of rules beauty yeah. as well. It's a lovely, lovely coincidence between um, wisdom of the ancients and and the astrology astrology and the the uh, attributes of the, of the gods um but i think it is a an, an aesthetic an aesthetic uh question venus by doing its 5813 draws us to the fibonacci numbers and the fibonacci numbers draw us to the golden section and the golden section is pretty much the the most one of the most aesthetic experiences we we have it seems to be at, at the bottom of um a lot of uh aesthetic judgments not only in its uh geometric form but it's in its harmonic form as well in, in the fi- in the fibonacci numbers so um yeah i would i absolutely agree with you mm. Mm. the correlation to beauty is part of it but there's also value in it right like in the system that say we get from hellenistic times of astrology you have taurus libra that are both ruled by Venus and Taurus is everything that has inherent value. So money, assets, etc. And then in Libra, you have the aesthetics or the beauty, the music, the harmonies. And mm-hmm. to, to make that correlation and also in a way like the Taurian side of things, it brings us directly into the plant world or of earth. And also like, how do we even create 
currency, right? Where does that, where, where does that come from? It's something to do with all of what we're seeing, I think, with the Venus cycle. That's right. Um, it's really interesting. I've never really understand the relationship between Venus and money. Um, but it, I, I, um, the, the, the Libra thing, I think I can, I understand a little bit better because what you were saying really about balance is all to do with symmetry. Symmetry is at, at the core of aesthetics as well of, of beauty. And, um, and of course, balance is, is symmetry. And our aesthetic sense is, is also driven by symmetries not only of not only visual symmetries but um but in eth ethical symmetries as well the the uh the punishment fitting the crime the um the giving and the receiving and accepting and returning of gifts which was a very important uh concept in, in the renaissance that idea of proportionality is uh is absolutely current you'll have to you'll have to explain the um the venus and money thing. I've always never understood it. Someone did explain it to me once, but I, I, mm. I, I've completely forgotten how it works. Why she's, um, why she's associated with finance, but she is, isn't she? If I'm not much mistaken. Very much so. And I mean, I suppose with what, like, like using what you were just saying with the proportion of give and take and agreements between people, that's the heart of any currency. And so mm -hmm. in a way, the world's first currency could be seen as, the symbol for Taurus, which is cattle or, you know, the bull. And there's been a lot of evolution of that over the years and, you know, use one of the most recent currencies that the world is seeing, which is digital currency like Bitcoin. And people argue like, well, it has no inherent value. But when two people agree that this algorithm and this cryptography mm. actually has value, then all of a sudden, voila, it's there. And so in some sense, it begins with that peer to peer agreement and then the value then comes from it but in both vedic and western traditions of astrology they both have that correlation with venus and how it relates to your assets how fascinating so it really is it's an extension of 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 balance and fairness the word fairness if you like fairness at being fair uh, as in beautiful but also being fair as in as in balanced then i think so yeah mm -hmm. so whether it's a cow or a bitcoin it's mm -hmm. <laughs> it's an agreement between yeah. two people. Certainly, in modern age, Bitcoin's a, a far easier way to to do a transaction than shipping a cow <laughs> somewhere. Yeah, yeah, a little bit, a little bit. So, Sun, Moon, Venus, and Ice Halos are all going to show up in the new book. Yeah, when's it yeah, coming out? Um, I am hoping it'll be finished by the summer. Um, then I think it's going to need to be checked over uh, by uh, by some people. I think um, there's a professor at uh, in London who specialises in the, the multiverse multiverse cosmology. I'm going to see if I can get him to uh, point a few of his PhD students my way, and I'll pay them to, to check it all over. I don't want to have any mistakes in there. Um, and then it's just going to need a cover and a bit of promo, and I think we'll maybe it'll be out next spring next year something like that i think so it should be quite a short read uh but it's such a good feeling to have finally had the time to to write it i'm uh i'm a bit like one of those midwives that never gets to have a baby you know i'm always seeing other people's books through to press and um yeah, polishing up other people's writing and finding diagrams and pictures for people and uh, just to have a year off like this has just been a complete treat for me actually mm, i love hearing that and it seems, I mean, Wooden Books has been around 20 years, shorter? Yeah, we're just, just over 20 years. I think we're 22 years or something now. Yeah, that's right. And with so many in the pipeline, I mean, are you overseeing a lot of that or do you have a lot of hands helping you with that process? Uh, we've got this team of about three or four of us. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, I, every book goes pretty much through me. By by the end, I'm, I'm doing a lot of the polishing. Uh -huh. And uh, it's... Um, yeah, it's uh, good fun. I mean, we've got with so many in the pipeline, we we're kind of trying to expand a bit and uh, bring on some more editors and book designers. So uh, it, we can we can get get these books get these books out. We're launching in the in the US in paperback later this year for in the fall. So that'll be interesting as well. At the moment, we're really only available. We used to be in hard hardcover in the US, published by Bloomsbury, well Walker, and then Bloomsbury, and then. We'll be in soft cover in the US 
this full price, I think seven ninety five. We'll see if we can um, see if we can get some traction with with uh, the little books again. At the moment, all that's really available in the US are the big books, the Quadrivium and and Trivium and Sciencer and those ones. So it's going to yeah. be an interesting autumn. They're quite popular. I've seen the Quadrivium on many shelves. Quadrivium really yeah. does sell very well. It's pretty much all over the world. It's doing doing um, doing things uh, primarily in the UK and the US, but uh, but it's available in Russian and Spanish and everything really now. Yep, Italian. And speaking of aesthetic, my goodness, it's beautiful. I mean, just to buy it because it's it's beauty. It, it leaps at you. <laughs> <laughs> like the, like the text very, and everything about very it. Kind. it. It's also legible, which is good. Um, the slightly larger size means you can actually read it. Um, we, I've just reached nature. I'm finding actually struggling to read some of our own books because uh, the little books are really little and the, <laughs> the text is really little. I used to get older readers saying to me, Guy, can't you make it a bit bigger? And I go, what's wrong with you? And <laughs> now I'm in my 50s. I'm in the same uh, in the same boat. I go, oh, God, is it really this small? Have I really been making it this small for this long? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, we're making them a tiny bit bigger for, for the US market. Oh, that's good. Yeah, because the the few I've read, I've had them close to my face, John. Very close <laughs> to <Yeah>. my face. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. It is a problem. So I, I mean, either we we could just pulp the whole of the uh, the UK print range and start again slightly lar- larger, but uh, I think we're going to get complaints from people who've uh, collect- collected them so far. So yeah, no, I've been collecting them. I've ordered many in the previous couple of years that I've been aware of them. So oh, don't, great. D- don't pulp them. Well, we got some uh, really nice ones uh, arriving in a month's time. There's a lovely book on shadows, one of my favourite books for the last five years, written by Will Vaughan, who's a professor of uh, history of art in in London. That's a lovely book. He really gets very deep into shadows and what they are, shadows in art, shadows in in life, shadows in culture, uh, shadows in the psyche. It's just a very, very thought-provoking book by a by a man who's been thinking about this for a long time. And he's boiled all of his lifetimes thinking into this tiny little book for us. It's absolute jewel. And then we've got one on mythological animals and one on altered states. That's uh, all the different uh, drugs we take, everything from coffee to sugar and how they work. Um, and then one on divination. Those are, I've got four new books for March. Oh, that is exciting. I want to have all of your wooden book authors on this show, John. I should just go through them. That'll be my <laughs> yes. podcast, the wooden podcast. Well, I can put you in touch. Yeah. Well, I told you that, uh, Earl, because I found his podcast and yeah. I really enjoy his podcast. I hope I hope to make connection with him when I'm back in Dartmoor and get him on. Yeah. Yeah, he's great. He's such a scholar, Earl. He, he really is. I, I always feel... Um, I always feel uh, like I, I've never read a single book in my life when I talk to Earl. He's uh, incredibly scholarly in his uh, endeavors. Yeah, yeah. Amazing. So a couple of things I want to make sure I add, because I was seeing on your website that you are still teaching a couple of these COVID willing, like the art and craft of Labyrinth. Are you still doing that in February? Um, I well, Am I doing that? I'm not sure. I think maybe that was Dan- is that Daniel down at uh, Emerson College. Mm-hmm. He's uh, I don't know if he's up and running or, or not, but uh, I may be involved with some of those. He normally uh, ropes me in every now and then. It's wonderful, wonderful courses he does. He, it really is. It reminds me of the old uh, visual Islamic traditional arts course, course taught by Keith Critchlow. He's just created a wonderful studio down there, and um, these wonderful, wonderful workshops. Everything from pigments to geometry to basket weaving it's a lovely lovely environment and uh yeah i do go down when i when i can but i'm not sure when the next one is uh okay. he's doing a, a venus day or something in the summer i think there was a venus thing cancelled last summer so maybe he's uh doing that i did a i did my talk on aesthetics on beauty uh recently with down there as well okay so scratch that i was just going to wonder if you had anything you wanted to plug aside from the book that you can get people excited about ah that's uh not really not really thank you adam no i'm i'm um i think uh wait wait for wait for coincidence the book the book will be called coincidence uh serendipity and the fine-tuning problem yes i'm excited to read that and i think i think you you do live close to adam right and I think you now it's coming together where he's like, oh, I want to bring you up to John's place. Like, I think mm-hmm. you have to go and visit John at his place. 
I think it sounds like we must we must hang out. I've got a, I've moved up, I moved up here to my my father's house uh, three years ago or something now. Quite and the estate is that it's part a of it? Beautiful, but yeah, there is this uh, big farm here and um, all sorts going on. My father's still running everything, so I have the best of both worlds. I don't have to take any responsibility, but I get <laughs> to enjoy the get to enjoy the the, the 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 beautiful house and everything. So yeah, you must come up when Adam's here. We'll have a have a big summer party. Yeah, and, uh, I love that. It's, uh, it's really lovely. And you, the, the amazing thing you'll, you'll, you'll find, Adam, when you come to East Anglia is that it, it doesn't rain here. Uh, unlike the West Country, we don't get any rain. Uh, we have, a, I think the West Country gets about eight times more rain. In fact, in fact, Suffolk is the, uh, pretty much the only county in, in the UK which you can um, say so is classified as semi-arid up here. It's a bit like uh, England's California. It's very nice. I've never heard this, but I do want to visit because Dartmoor gets a little intense. Yeah, I think it's it a good word for it. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm happy to be in Madeira right now. I'm not yeah. going to lie. It's, it's yeah, I think, I think that's a good, good rhythm you've got there. <laughs> so any final words of wisdom you'd like to share with the listeners? Um, no, Anything. I'll simply say that it's been really great being on your show uh the really great thing that happened was just before we got on air i think i mentioned to you i i tried to get my uh my files my original book big book of coincidence to, to work and um and i managed to suddenly locate in a folder i thought i'd lost all of the linked files and lo and behold i can now create a pdf i think of the original book of coincidence um which was the much bigger work my ma thesis that uh, contains all of this extra stuff that may be of more interest some of it to astrologers than than the, the general readership that my little book was aimed at so what i will do is keep working on this over the weekend i think stitch the book back together i'll make a pdf and email it to you and if any of your listeners want a a copy they can get in touch with you i think we'll do something like that okay well christmas came late this year john <laughs> i'm i'm open to receive this and yeah i'll like if you so you if you make this pdf and send it to me you're you're quite all right with m making it available to the public i'll certainly make it available to to your listeners yeah absolutely oh, if, they want, oh. if they want to share it they're very welcome to i've no no intention of um of uh, reprinting this this book, but it is quite highly sought after. I think copies go for a few hundred pounds. There were, there were only a thousand ever made. And if, for, for astrologers that really want to dig deeper into the geometrical, particularly the geometrical, my early work was on the geometry of the solar system, but there's a lot of extra bits and bobs in there that don't appear in the little book of coincidence. So yeah, I'll be really happy to share. And uh, it's uh, be a good thing. It's been great, great. Um, been really really a great product i wouldn't have i wouldn't have got it out if i hadn't been talking to you this evening so <laughs> well it's yeah great. that's a coincidence right there it, it is uh, <laughs> i'll put i'll make a site for it everyone listening because it'll take a second for john to do this and then it'll take a second for me as well to get it on my site but i will post it if it all comes together mm -hmm. so and i'll send you a link to john for sure great yeah well, this has been a pleasure it, and, and well met. I'm happy that we got to chat and yeah, best of luck with the three coincidences and I look forward to seeing you in person, hopefully someday. Thanks very much, Adam. Yeah, me, me too. I really look forward to, to meeting you in person and uh, I, I, hope, uh, I hope Madeira isn't too, isn't too hard on you. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's nothing so hard about it. I will be honest about that. Yeah. <laughs> <It's good. laughs> All right. Well, have a good evening. And have a great weekend. All right. Cheers. Ciao. And there it was, John Martinau and I talking about a few coincidences. I just want to say that if you were like, oh, Adam, why didn't you just say yes <laughs> when he brought up the wooden book idea of me writing it? I did email him back. I haven't heard yet the response or what will be of it. But I am, after sitting with it, very interested. And so we'll see if it actually happens. But if you're a fan of the Wooden Book series, you understand that there's a certain precedence that is set by the scholarship and just the beauty of those little books. And so I'm open to it. We'll see. No promises at the moment. If you want to check out John's stuff, sacredartofgeometry.com again his, is his site 
There's a link on my website for his book, and he didn't or yet has, has finished the big book of coincidence. So I'll have it available on my site when I do. I'll, I'll post about it. I'll put it in my newsletter. But yeah, thank you, John. That was an amazing conversation. I'm really happy that we got to meet. And I also look forward to traveling up to your estate with Adam in the future. I look forward to that. Again, this podcast is brought to you by Solar Fire. If you want to get it into your life, just go to their site, alabe.com. Use promo code SOMA to get 15% off of it. If you want to be a part of the Constellating Psyche program, all you need to do is become a $10 patron. Go to patreon.com slash adamsummer to do that. You'll be a part of the parlors and get access to all the patron-only shows as well. It's quite a lot, actually, that you get for $10 a month because there's, over, I think, over 50 parlors now. So 50 times to 100 hours of content just there alone 50 hours of podcasts and then all of the consolidating psyche classes that are coming down the pipe so patreon.com slash adam summer and you can just leave some reviews or stars on your podcast app and send me the screenshot and i'll link you to the dreaming with the moon class we just did or any class that you're called to so thank you so much for listening i'm going to leave you with a song by Probably a musician I've used more than any other on this podcast, and for good reason. I adore Greg and his music. Gregory and Alan Isakov from The Weatherman, a song called The Universe. And I just, it was hard to choose a song for this conversation. I couldn't find anything that was appropriate around coincidences. But The Universe, she's wounded, yet she still has infinity in front of her. And she's dancing now. (laughs) So if you're not familiar with Greg, which I'm sure you should be by now listening to the podcast, you can check him out. He's everywhere. Gregory and Alan Isakoff. Support his music. It's all great. Wonderful vibes. Very poetic. And I will talk with you next in February. I have quite the lineup moving forward. Be expecting shows with Michael Mead and some others. I'm very excited about who is on the lineup in February and March. And so be well, be kind, and you, Demonia. She sends me back as rain. rain The universe she's wounded She's still got infinity ahead of her She's still got you and me And everybody says Beautiful, 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 beautiful. She's beautiful, 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 beautiful. Everybody's. She's dancing now They got her lit up Lit up on the They got stars doing car wheels All the nebulas on the tomb The universe She's 
Whispering so softly I can hear all the croaking insects All the taxi cabs, all the bombs spent chains All the boys playing ball in the alleyways They just fall to new She's wounded But she's still got infinity ahead of her She's still got you and me Everybody says that she's beautiful, 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 beautiful oh, She's beautiful, beautiful Everybody says Everybody says